Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the webinar this morning. And thank you for your patience so far as we were ironing out um, some technical difficulties. We're still waiting for one of our panelists, um, Joe Tirado, to join. Um, but we are fortunate to have Anne Karin Grill with us already. So welcome to the second episode of this webinar series where we will focus on mediation and arbitration of investment disputes and whether these are two separate processes or whether they can be combined in some form. How do we get there? I'm sure um, you all are familiar with the investment mediation rules um, that exit proposed to its member states. And these rules are in fact already being applied in practice by agreement of the parties administered by exit. Besides the rules and the administration of investment mediation, we've been busy this summer publishing two documents, the background paper on investment mediation and an analysis of mediation clauses in investment treaties. And if I may ask Damon, our host, um, to post it in the chat um, so you have the links uh, directly, that would be great. Besides um, those publications, we've also supported working group three documents on mediation, conducted investor state mediator trainings and um, trainings for government officials on mediation skills. And here we are on this webinar where we want to feature panelists who have been involved either on the policy side in investment mediation or actually as participant in real investment mediations. And we will um, take that up um, with Anna Karin. We'll start and we continue to hope um, that Joe will be able to join us in some form later during the webinar. So before we start on the content and Anna Karin um, and I will dive into it, um, the way we have um, handled the questions from the audience is to, that we ask you to put them in the chat. Uh, that will allow us to pick them up at an appropriate time. You could also um, raise your hand and Damon will unmute you at um, an appropriate time. The chat function has um, really been helpful um, last week. So with all of that, Anne Karin, let me turn to you. Thank you for joining. You have experience as an investment arbitration practitioner um, in ICSID and other cases. And now you're also an experienced mediator, including mediating disputes um, that involve a state or a state entity. Can you share a few ideas from practice with us? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Frauke. It's a real pleasure to kind of share my experiences and to spread the word that investor state mediation is actually happening. And um, from what I've seen, mostly on, mostly on the part of the investors, is really a tool that is appreciated because it gives you a different option from arbitration, which everybody knows takes time and effort and nerves. I'm not saying that mediation is an easy way out, but is definitely a more individual way out, meaning that you can move from a legal assessment of the facts of the case to a commercial deal making. And this is really what has been, and I think continues to attract businesses um, because when you are running a business, when you are making a large scale investment, uh, you very much look into opportunities and mediation is definitely an opportunity. It helps you sa save time. It helps you, helps you save costs and, uh, you remain in the driver's seat as the negotiating party. And this is a benefit that I believe um participants in mediation increasingly appreciate about the process mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting you mentioned sort of commercial operational project side of it right an ability to structure um 
to structure a deal or an agreement um, to address issues that have arisen, and that is in the operational side certainly normal. Um, one thing that made I was thinking of when I was listening to you is that uh, mediation in that sense uh, is may perhaps not only for like the arbitration alternative of the cases that would go to arbitration anyway, but perhaps also opening it up um, for other disputes um, when you have, for example, diversified investment that you may not go for arbitration in one sector over another. But before we, may I catch you? I see we have Joe on the line and I am thrilled that we have overcome um, these technical difficulties. Um, thank you, Joe, for joining. And we just uh, welcomed our participants and had a, a first impression um, from anne Karine about sort of experience on investment mediation. Would you like to add something of investment mediation and arbitration? What are the benefits of investment mediation? Absolutely. First of all, let me give my sincere apologies for the delay in joining you. I'm, I'm not sure quite what happened, but it's been a, quite a nightmare. So I'm very glad that uh, to able to connect finally. Uh, delighted to see you again, Prata and I'm Karine. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you today. Um, in terms of, I've been fortunate enough to have had experience both as counsel and mediator in both contract and treaty based uh, uh, mediations. And, and I think. Um, what is interesting about them is that I think there are huge, first and foremost, there are huge similarities, I think, with what we commonly understand in commercial mediation. So in some ways, I think there's a, a myth or, um, to dispel right away that while it, um, there are special peculiarities about investment mediation, there are a lot of similarities. So it shouldn't, it's not, um, shouldn't scare anybody away. Um, but I think certainly in terms of the advantages for investment mediation, with that kind of introduction are very similar to what you see in commercial uh, mediation. At the end of the day, it's the speed, uh, saving time, saving costs of resolving matters in a way that I think allows party to approach uh, the dispute in a far more flexible way um, in terms of the resolution they ultimately um, uh, reach. Um, it allows parties to be much more creative, I think, in the, in the, in the outcome of the dispute and, of course, avoid the all-important um, issues about enforcement that, that may be there as well when you have a consensual uh, resolution. So I think there's every reason um, for parties to consider uh, mediation and one is seeing that as a result there is a growing trend I think to acceptance both from um, states and uh, those acting against states to consider other forms of dispute resolution for those very reasons because it's uh, as we all know it can be very expensive to take and take a long time if you're arbitrating investment disputes. Uh, and mediation does offer a viable, genuine alternative. I think we've moved away from the sense of that it perhaps it really not doesn't really apply in this field because it's a very sophisticated um, area. But in reality, I think we um, um, can see that that's not the case, and it can be used uh, extremely effective use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Joe, for for um, setting out uh, sort of the benefits from your experience there. And um, one one statistic, perhaps, to add that my colleagues from the World Bank have actually assessed that only about six percent of investor state disputes end up in arbitration, and about ninety four percent um of issues where issues have arisen, the investment is simply abandoned or expansions are abandoned or the project in itself. So mediation may offer an opportunity, especially um, for that um, portion of disputes um, that we don't see in the arbitration. But back to you, Anne Karin, um, what is your background on investment mediation? You have practical experience. Would you I mind do. sharing? Yeah. <laughs> of, of course not. Um, it's been a very interesting uh, experience. I have been involved in uh, a very formal mediation procedure uh, that uh, took place last year in an Eastern European jurisdiction. Um, and um, what can I say? The prerequisites were there. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the matrix of the dispute was such that there was room for maneuver, negotiated 
options were something that was realistically available to the parties. And unfortunately, what I saw was a, a procedure that was conducted only in a lukewarm manner. There were too many uh, players involved and some were not at the table, but that's not to say that the important player was not at the table and that's the state. I really appreciated the involvement of state representatives in the process. They did engage. Um, there was a solution at the end of the process, but it did not cover everything. So probably the problem that I saw there was that, um, you know, in terms of timing, uh, there, there, there should have been a little more flexibility, but the direction taken and uh, the kind of engagement that we saw in that mediation, that was real. And uh, it was actually run very professionally. And uh, you have to know perhaps that I was engaged on the side of the investors in that case. So um, of course there the pressure was quite high. And why did I, get involved because these investors really believed that mediation could produce a result that would benefit both sides. Uh, and they didn't know what to expect in the mediation. So uh, very clearly they were looking for legal support, but in a procedural mechanism that is more flexible than arbitration, where the rules are not determined by a fixed a uh, regulatory scheme, really, uh, but a lot is designed as you go along and you um, you develop the priorities together with your negotiation partner. And so they were looking for guidance as to how to deal with that flexibility and how to take one step of the other and how to really work with the mediator, because the mediator is really the spider in the web if I can put it that way. And it's a person that is ultimately not the audience that you're pleading to. It is more, uh, the mediator is your tool. They help you to get your points across. They can open doors in a conversation. So it's not really about their assessment. It's more of what they can do for you to keep the communication flowing and to cut down to the really critical issues in order to, you know, create circumstances in which both sides realize that a settlement is really what helps them. And I can only confirm what I heard from Joe earlier. It's not so dissimilar to what we do in commercial mediation. Again, the focus in mediation generally is on the commercial side of matters and uh, trying to rise above the legal really in order to achieve a result that makes everybody happy. And uh, this is possible if you have an investment project that still can be saved, where there is room for maneuver, as I put it earlier, and where there's an interest on both the side of the investor and the state to make the project happen regardless of the bumps in the road that have been experienced in the past. Thank you. Thanks for sharing the insights and a broader umbrella about um, mediation. Joe, over to you. What is your experience in investment mediation? Well, if I may say so, I think Anne-Karine immediately identified one of the problems within, where, where there is a difference, I would say, from commercial mediation is identifying the state. What, what is the state? What's it consist of? I mean, it could be a state entity. Um, but again, it's trying to understand which ministry you're dealing with. It may be that the dispute falls under the responsibility of one ministry, but actually the finance aspect might be by another ministry. And so I think part of the difficulty is identifying who is it, you are, who are actually the real parties and the stakeholders in, in the mediation. And that um, is imperative, I think, in order to try and move things along uh, smoothly so to know who you need to deal with. Uh, factoring in, I think Ankarin as well also mentioned, you know, the timing of all of this and being um, cognizant of the various parties involved. And of course, it's, uh, governments are different 
all over the world. I mean, democratic type of organization may be very different from a more um, uh, where you have a, a state where it's um, run by uh, effectively a dictator in some places or some uh, other form of government. So I think identifying your state party from an investor point of view is certainly very complex. But I said, and so engagement is very important. Uh, and I think one of the frustrating things, historically at least, is finding that states have not really engaged, partly because there's a communication issue, just knowing about it, the right people knowing about it at the right time, and then fundamentally not having a proper understanding of what the system is and how it could be um, used. So there's an element of, for want of a better term, ignorance in terms of, um, uh, of understanding the process, which is, again, can be quite frustrating. We see that, of course, with commercial parties, but in historically speaking, I think you've seen that in, in greater a relief with um, state entities. That, mostly is changing and changing very rapidly, if I may say so, uh, largely as well as a part of the work that ICSID and many other international organizations are doing. But the states themselves uh, as, as seem to be drawing a line and saying, hang on, we need to do this a different way. Mm, um, and I can confirm that um, from sort of the consultations we've had and the contributions in working group three, um, you may be familiar with the two mediation papers that the Ancetral working group published. Um, there is one on guidelines on mediation that deals um, especially with the structural organizational aspects for states to consider to allow this flow of communication to get to the right people to identify stakeholders, which is what we've historically heard, not only for developing states, but also from developed states, in fact, of who is actually in charge of um, uh, taking the lead on a negotiated settlement discussion before a request for arbitration, for example, is filed. Um, thank you, Joe, for sort of um, getting that big overview and your personal experience with mediation. You have mediated investment disputes, right? I, I, I have. I, I mean, I, I, number one, there are obviously not as many. I, I would say that at the risk of stating the obvious um, as one um, would hope there to be or think they could, the potential for there to be. Uh, but I have, as I mentioned, acted both as a council where um, actually uh, an interesting one where the state itself was the mediating body. So while it, it, in a different form, so there was an interesting dynamic there in terms of neutrality and confidentiality and, and a slightly different form that was its count as council. But um, certainly I've been involved in um, uh, airline sector telecommunications um, where one party, was the state itself, where it was truly the state that was the kind of uh, respondent in it, just did not participate. It was frustrating, um, just sending repeat emails and you're adding really relatively little value in that type of scenario. The other one was a state entity, it was a national airline, um, that uh, was couldn't do anything without the relevant or approvals from the relevant ministers, but was very engaging uh, in the whole process, was determined um, to get involved. Interestingly, it was a much lower amount than the one where the party, the states who didn't engage, you would think it'd be in their interest to engage and avoid uh, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars a state there, they just didn't want to engaged. The other one was a much smaller amount, relatively speaking, under $10 million, but they were engaging in it, albeit with the added complications, as I said, of having to report back and the delay um, in, that was built into that process, but they engaged in that in a, in a meaningful way, and I was I'm pleased to say that that ended in a successful settlement. Uh, and also, I've been fortunate enough to be appointed by the World Bank as an expo consultant in Latin America, uh, where there are states uh, actively looking for uh, into ADR reform. And so that's, again, an encouraging in, um, indication that they are reaching out. It's not people um, thrusting it down their throat, or but there are actually states out there looking to see what how they can um, modernize their system. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and a lot of material is coming out of the domestic legal framework. For those who joined us last week, um, that is what um, the Energy Charter Secretariat has um, created a, a model instrument of aspects to regulate on the domestic level um, that could help here. 
Um, turning back to you, Anna Karin, you already touched a bit upon um, sort of the role of the mediator and the arbitrator, but let's look at it from a process perspective. What are, from your view, the main differences between arbitration and mediation in the investment context? As I mentioned earlier, I think the um, the biggest difference for me is really, uh, you know, who is the designated recipient of your message as a negotiating party because the mediation is in fact a very sophisticated negotiation and um, i think what people are mostly not aware of unless they have significant experience of media media mediating cases is that the dynamics change as soon as this neutral third party that does not have any stakes in the dispute sits at the table together with them. So um, I, I think this would be my first point. Uh, the second would be that um, you need, when you're sitting as mediator, uh, you need to have this comfort or be comfortable with the, uh, a rather high level approach, seeing the bigger picture, you know, guiding the parties through a process that is pretty much determined by themselves in terms of the aspects that they feel need to be discussed to make a settlement work, but, uh, you know, to keep them focused and not lose sight of, of, of the bigger picture. Um, I sit both as an arbitrator and as a mediator. Uh, in my day job. And uh, one thing that I also want to stress is that as a mediator, it's a full-time engagement. So it's not just that you reserve some time on a special day where you read the file and you work on your award or you uh, work on a procedural decision. Um, the people really want you to be in that boat with them and they, want that immediate interaction with you as the mediator and you need to be uh, available not only in terms of the time that you can commit to the dispute resolution process, but you also need to have a certain degree of stamina to keep pressing for that solution. And when I say pressing, I don't mean that you necessarily tell the parties this is a good choice and this isn't. Um, I think uh, if you were to do that, uh, your neutrality goes out of the window like that. But, um, you know, to have an open ear, to listen what is said between the lines, to um, also allow for complaints. People need to let off steam. Uh, and uh, that is a very personal aspect that we cannot overlook when we talk about mediation. So I think, um, and this will not be a surprising comment, uh, the parties should be very careful and look exactly into the profiles of their prospective mediators, um, because, you know, it's not only about personality and personal preference, and, you know, you open up more easily to one person over another, but you also want to look for their professional profile as a mediator and, 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 and really understand that they have experience and they know what it is about, and uh, they know what it means to be in the eye of the storm. Uh, for more than just one or two sessions, because those processes, they continue over certain periods of times. Uh, um, I know that we are very often discussing the benefits of mediation over arbitration through that lens of uh, time and cost efficiency, but uh, the co more complex the issues are, the more time should be spent, and most of the time, uh, it will be spent well in mediation. Mm. And I can confirm, you know, it looks very different. Uh, a mediation looks very different in terms of dynamics in the room uh, than what we are all familiar with from an investment arbitration hearing setup. Joe, over to you. What, what are the main differences between mediation or arbitration? Or maybe you'd like to pick up some points Anne-Karin well, made. It, 
If I may, in fact, the very last point you made in terms of the dynamics, often a lot of this is not in the room. It's It kind of alludes back to what I was saying further down the line, the command chain of if you're dealing with various ministries and being aware and sensitive to that. So there, there are actually procedural differences, or mechanical differences in terms of how you might conduct the process. Uh, but I think um, Anne Karine said right at the very beginning, and I think I'm also conscious that to a large part, I hope we're preaching to the converted and we all accept that I think that mediation used in the right way at the right time can be an extremely effective um, tool, but importantly, with the right mediator and or mediators. And I think in, in, in an investment um, uh, scenario, there's perhaps arguably a greater scope for using co-mediation rather than just a single mediator. That's a whole topic in itself that we can explore if, if time allows. Um, but I think it's in, you know, it is important that, that to recognize that having started off the conversation by saying, well, there's huge similarities, and, and of course the skill set that you get from commercial mediation is of course a very useful basis. There are some really subtle but important differences in investment mediation and understanding that dynamic about how governments might work in their interaction, whether it's in the room or out of the room, is very important as well. Understanding the mechanics of a treat, uh, if it's a treaty based um, uh, mediation can be helpful. So there are, I think, certain uh, qualifications, additional qualifications that um, uh, a mediator who uh, looking to do this kind of work will bring and importantly experience as well so it's not a, i don't think one you could be a great commercial mediator doesn't automatically make you a great um investment mediator uh, it might be stating the obvious but i think sometimes you know the difference can seem so minor you think well it's all pretty much much of the same thing so i i would just stress that there are subtle differences mm. uh, yeah that's underlined and that, that is selected, it feeds on who you're going to be selecting as mediator. That's, uh, yeah, yes. Um, I just want to underline, Anne Karin set out the differences, arbitration mediation, and Joe picked up on the investment mediation versus commercial mediation. And I hear you both um, agree on the importance of the mediator skills and then the understanding of the context. What I can add here maybe is that the IMI in 2016 set out um, uh, qualifications of mediators in investment disputes. The IBA 2012 rules have an annex also dealing with um, qualifications of mediators, and we pick that up in our background paper as well. But now moving on to the topic, actually, of, um, of our webinar about combination and separation. And I note for our audience, I see the questions in the chat and we, we will get to you, um, I promise. Uh, so if we move on, what are possible combination options? Is it um, a good idea to combine or not? Um, what are your views, Anna Karin? Maybe you start. I think it's very realistic and very feasible to combine the two methods. I'm actually advocating for this and probably the most sensitive aspect for counsel to keep in mind there is that timing is, is really what matters. So uh, in practice, what we see is, is that uh, very early on in the dispute resolution process, it can be tricky to start settlement negotiations because the two sides have not had sufficient opportunity to form uh, an opinion about the case, to really understand all its implications. And I'm not only talking about the legal, I'm also very much talking about the technical aspects of uh, the investment dispute and the, the actual project that is at the heart of the dispute. Um, so, early on, there might be a requirement for both sides to form a better understanding of what is at stake. So, usually what we see after the first exchange of written submissions, uh, the fogs have cleared and that there is a momentum to, to actually engage and discuss what is on the table. And so, it can be a really smart idea, also from an efficiency point of view in the proceedings, 
to already consider what we would call mediation windows in the procedural timetable. This is something that can be discussed once the arbitration has formally started. Um, and, and, and this is where also the arbitrators can be very helpful in allowing for mediation to take place. But that, of course, and you know, that's just my philosophy, um, will require an understanding that the arbitrators will not act as the mediators in the case. So um, there needs to be this flexibility of mind also of everybody involved. Uh, and I think the key word there is uh, users happiness, I would even call it, you know, it's not an easy decision to take a case to investment arbitration or to really in, embark on that process of dispute resolution. So um, again, the bigger picture is, is to resolve the dispute. And I think every means that contributes to the resolution of the dispute is valuable and should be enabled. So all the players, be it on the arbitration side or the mediation and even institutional side should do everything in their power to really allow for that flexibility of, of approaches. Uh, so I very, very much speak in favor of combining arbitration and mediation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joe, what are your thoughts on well, I, 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 Again, I think it's difficult to have a speak about anything legal with an audience of lawyers and not use the word it depends. Um, uh, of course, timing is indeed key. Uh, uh, but as a general rule, and I think everybody does have a part of play. Interestingly, I think uh, Ankarin made a reference to the arbitrators. I think having arbitrators who are proactively looking or creating windows to see where a dispute um, can either run in parallel or uh, uh, being open to staying uh, arbitration proceedings to allow parties to pursue uh, a mediation, I think is again, uh, something that's changed quite significantly in recent years. And uh, you gone are the days where you have somebody approaching an arbitration just in a tunnel vision uh, type of approach and they're just there to arbitrate, they will at least explore the opportunity, possibilities uh, for parties to perhaps, as I say, um, uh, embark on a mediation simultaneously in parallel with the um, arbitration, or as I say, staying the arbitration. Uh, I think a key issue is who, act, who acts as mediator and arbitrator where you have parallel proceedings in play. I think we're gonna turn to that and look at that in, uh, in some detail in a moment. So I, I, I will re reserve my comments on that. But yes, I think where it makes sense. I mean, I just would not be too prescriptive about these things. Sometimes I, I my gut reaction is to say, well, clearly, and to kind of um, harness that natural uh, dynamic that you refer to in your um, quite stark statistics that you were quoting to us. The reality is most disputes will settle. And if you can kind of harness that sooner rather than later, that has to be in everybody's best interest. But sometimes you need to have a bit of pain. You need to have a bit of cost. Um, on both sides of people to kind of start um, perhaps taking a more realistic approach to how they're going to deal with it. Um, I, but it would seem to make sense to try and um, see what room there is at, at the outset, if not at the very least to try and minimize the issues that are going to be really the issue of any arbitration. So I, I think it's um, important to keep all options open and all parties, the you know, council, uh, clearly parties themselves, but uh, both the uh, and the arbitral tribunal has a role, role to play there. And there I say, if it's being managed by an institution as well, the institution. So there's a, a, there are a lot of stakeholders involved here who have a part to play that to encourage um, uh, parties to reach, uh, to, to get on that goal of what's, for most part, not always, there is a, obviously there are always the exception as to why you will want an award ultimately or a judgment somewhere else. Uh, but most of it want to, most uh, of the time, the objective is to try and reach a, a resolution without uh, a full blown arbitration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So different points, it depends timing. It might be in a parallel to an arbitration at one point in an arbitration, maybe even initiated by arbitrators, what we've seen after, for example, um, a decision on liability, uh, but potentially also before, that's what I heard, um, before the arbitration at the project stage, perhaps um, maybe even before a notice of dispute. 
and you mentioned a uh, possible other combination. Why don't you pick that up right away? Well, if I may, I mean, I, I one can I've saw I have seen recently in a slightly different context, but one could see this in the context of an of a mediation. I think there's always again that kind of you're pushing against that sense that mediation is the weaker form of res resolution, uh, as opposed to actually looking at it as a, as a force of strength. And I, I've seen that in the scenario where a party has already initiated um, uh, an investor state arbitration. So they've obviously thought about it. They've paid quite a lot of money up front investing that. And, and I think that the difficulty is once you start in that process, there is a sense that it may be, well, we've started down that line and um, you kind of fall into a tunnel that you did get um, thrown out at the end of it after quite a bit of time and a bit of money. But actually, I think uh, where it was used in the slightly different context, as I say, but one could imagine where the uh, mediation were, notwithstanding the fact you've initiated your arbitration, to proactively go and in initiate a mediation as a way to actually put pressure on the arbitration and raise some of these issues a lot uh, sooner than they might otherwise come up during the arbitration. And in the case I'm thinking, as I say, it's a slightly different scenario, but it worked. Uh, and, and the parties actually reached a settlement and they avoided a very significant investor state ar ar arbitration. Um, so I think it's uh, looking at it from uh, you know, um, a positive uh, perspective and uh, truly open-minded. I think there's always a danger of overselling mediation and sounding evangelical and putting people off, particularly when you're involved in big commercial matters. But in reality, I think if you just experience it, it's certainly my personal experience uh, I've seen, and I think anecdotally, you see that it's far from soft. This is a really effective form of dispute resolution that works. That requires a lot of work, uh, as Anna Karin already hinted. Anna yep. Karin, do you have things to add on this combination choices? Well, I think uh, we already hit all the crucial points there. Um, and I, I'm very happy to see that we're so aligned on everything. And I think that's uh, that really comes with the experience because. Um, Again, I, I, I need to say it's always different we, when you are the person in the hot seat. And one or two words that I would like to say also from an angle of practices is that um, we need to ensure that we build capacity also on the part of counsel. Because when you are mediating a case, it is extremely helpful to know that the lawyers are actually your allies, that they have their client's best interests in mind, and that they speak the same language as you do as the mediator. And of course, I don't mean language language, I mean resolution language. And uh, sometimes I get a feeling that uh, counsel are not really prepared to engage in mediation in a way that is really helpful for their clients uh, because they are so used to and actually trained to be there as um, the spokesperson for the client, the one who translates the factual matrix into a legal argument that is supposed to convince a decision maker. Uh, in the case of mediation, it's really the parties who take the front seat who have an idea of what it is that they need to get out of the dilemma, out of that dispute that has arisen. And the lawyers are only there to draw the lines in the sand and to tell them, you know, if you go there, you give too, too much, really. You, you don't have to do that. Um, and so I would really encourage all the lawyers listening uh, to us this afternoon or morning uh, to, to uh, really work on their mediation advocacy skills, because this is also a way to really fully unlock the potential of your case for your clients. Um, and another thing that is really striking to me, and we, we've been touching on this before, and it's this timing aspect. I feel like uh, sometimes it's not really visible what the lawyers have done for their clients in terms of assessing the case really looking into that zone of potential agreement, the ZOPA, um, you know, that area where a settlement really makes sense commercially. 
and they work with, I don't know, decision tree tools or any other technical tools to, to really make it plausible for that client why a settlement matters at a certain stage of the dispute. So again, this is really a shout out to, uh, to counsel out there to, to broaden the scope of their skill set to, to be effective also at this uh, interjection of arbitration and mediation. Thank you, Anna Karin. Now I suggest we turn to the chat um, to have another five minutes um, or something to that extent. Um, we started a little late, but uh, that we make sure we address questions from the audience and Anna Karin and Joe, I think you can see them as well. A couple of the questions deal with Singapore Convention enforcement um, questions on mediated settlement. Maybe I can start out again with some statistics on that front is that if we see um, settlements in the exit context where parties agree to terminate the arbitration because they have reached a settlement out of about 280, I believe it is of original arbitrations, only about a handful came back um, uh, on the basis of an exit um, arbitration clause alleging non-compliance with the settlement. So that from that perspective, it seems to suggest that there is actually, a, once you reach a settlement, there is a high compliance rate. What is your experience there? Joe, maybe we start with you. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, my personal practice will uh, echo what uh, similar to those statistics and in commercial mediation ones looking at consistently um, settlement rates of 75 plus percent on the day, another 10 or so percent within a short period, say a couple of weeks after, so extremely high. So again, when used in the right way at the right time with the right mediator, it can be incredibly powerful. And that's a statistic that it never ceases to amaze me. I say it at nearly every mediation talk I ever I get an opportunity to because people, you know, there are very few things in life that will give you anywhere near that kind of um, uh, rate of return, if you like, or probability of success, and um, uh, and yet people don't seem to absorb it and seem to think it applies to other people and not to them. And there's no reason, really, to see why it, it shouldn't. As to the Singapore Convention, I have to I'm going to be uh, candid to be a little bit provocative. I'm disappointed uh, in reality of it. I think it's a uh, step on the positive. I think anything that promotes uh, mediation and takes away obstacles to mediation has got to be a good thing. And certainly, the Singapore Convention does that. Uh, my reason for saying why it's disappointed, and number one, I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed there aren't more states that have signed up to it. I think it's something like 55, but there's about 196 I think, in the UN. You know, it falls way short compared to the New York Convention, but the New York Convention has been going for longer. Uh, and actually out of that number, it's only, I think, eight that have ratified it. So it's still early days and there's still some way to go, but it's not the panacea that I think a lot of people like to think it is partly because it, in some ways it's not really needed because as you just pointed out the statistics seem to show that actually most people um most parties do comply with the agreement they've reached and i think that's an important reason why they do do that it's their it's their agreement when they don't it's generally because they can't they become insolvent or something like that rather than willingly not to whereas i think in an arbitration where you have an imposed award you know, it's almost default. Everybody will look at any way to try and at least challenge the award and then resist enforcement. So um, I think I'll pause there and then I'm going to say something. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yeah, Anna Karin, <laughs> what are your thoughts? I can only support the statement that the Singapore Convention was a very important step to give more um, traction, really, to mediation as a dispute resolution tool. Are we where we're supposed to be or where we're hoping to be? Not quite yet. I agree with that too. But on the other hand, if I see or if I just look at, you know, what it did in terms of the uh, initiatives we see at Uncetrol, yeah, uh, what we see in terms of international trade agreements, where now we see individual mediation chapters, mandatory mediation, I think the enforcement aspect is actually the one that is a true game changer. Um, while we don't have the Singapore Convention quite where we want it to be, um, we will have to be creative in thinking of how to 
you know, prop up uh, your mediated agreement and consent awards have been a really convincing tools for parties in uh, arbitration. So to uh, to to uh, start out in an arbitration, to um, suspend for the purposes of having a mediation, and then an option of returning into arbitration just to have the settlement then uh, turned into uh, an award by consent, that can be very powerful. And in practice, it has proven that this is what is needed to keep people at the negotiation table. Um, it, it really enforcement is the one aspect around which everything turns, it uh, turns, it seems. So um, yeah, let's be hopeful. I think, especially in the investor state uh, context, we also have those creative options and let's use them. And this is really also where the lawyers counsel in the dispute resolution process can make a big impact in advising on how to, to make the settlement agreement more robust and uh, sustainable. Thanks. Thanks, Anna Karin. We have a question in the chat about the difference between mediator and arbitrator. And here I just um, refer back to what we discussed before, uh, what Joe and Anna Karin shared that um, those are different people indeed, and that there is a very different skill set involved as well. Um, then there is a question about um, if you hear about it, yeah, the question focuses on state to state mediation, but I think it uh, it applies to investor state as well. Is there an, a risk that this mediation before an arbitration is to buy time, delay proceedings uh, and to engage in the in the mediation um, to delay everything rather than actually engage? I would argue you could, um, if that is a risk, um, that is a concern, you could agree to mediate for a set, a specified time, uh, two, three, four months. And if there is no agreement after that, then the arbitration commences. But um, Joe and Anna Karin, maybe one sentence from each of you or two. Um, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, I would just say, yes, of course, there's a risk, but actually it's a risk worth taking because actually even the most cynical parties can sometimes surprise themselves and end up with a, res a resolution that they didn't think or were expecting they could get. So I think, yes, it, it properly managed the way you suggested. I think you can minimize that risk. Of course, it's ultimately there is a risk. Yeah, my sentence would be, uh, yeah. Push your lawyers to be creative and draft the mediation clause in a way where it's contained. And uh, Faku, you gave it away. The, the most patent trick there in the box of the dispute resolution lawyer is to set firm deadlines. And, um, you know, if you don't make it within that timeline, you move to the next level and escalate. Thank you. There's one other question in the chat or comment um, that relates a little bit to the comparison between commercial and investor state mediation. And can you really compare the two, given that there are political aspects at play in the investor state context? Um, uh, I'll start out here with um, that my understanding from the two of you was the comparison is process oriented. The process on mediation, whether commercial or investor state, the process, um, the steps, uh, the tools used, um, they are similar. And then I think Joe was the one to point out um, how the context uh, shifts in that area. A sentence from each of you on that? And Green, do you want to? Okay. We are mooted, Anna yeah. Karin. We oh, cannot hear. So, sorry, yeah. sorry. No, it works. Perfect. <laughs> um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, at least when I was referring to those similarities, it was uh, more of a, a co comment that was focused on dynamics at the negotiation table, and I think that is very similar um, with regard to the actual parties that are at the table. I think there are uh, sensitive issues. I think uh, mediators should be very sensitive 
um, knowing how to properly address state representatives. Uh, you know, some people like to be less formal. Others really love the formal and need the formal. Uh, so th th there's certain sensitivities there. Um, and then, of course, and this is one aspect that I believe makes mediation, especially in investor state context, uh, con context excuse me, uh, even more attractive uh, than just in the commercial context, is, is that you can bring uh, additional parties to the table. You can actually also invite uh, stakeholders that are not uh, implicated in the actual dispute. And when you enlarge the group, you need to have the skill set to actually deal with that larger group. So um, I, I think these would be my my reference points here. And briefly, I would just say, yes, of course, the political is, I think, a very um, important. It's not just a preserve of, of states. It can happen with companies as well. But generally, yes, it can be a, a, a major hindrance to there being a settlement because actually somebody will just will be afraid uh, for a party. It's kind of political short termism um, because they don't want to be the ones to take the heat uh, or worry that what they make a decision and ultimately a different party comes into power and they're going to be held accountable for that. So that there is a problem, but there are ways around that. And uh, the guidelines which you referred to uh, are, um, uh, are helpful, I think, in trying to address those issues. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the flip side of it, a political um, change may also be conducive to settlement. We've seen that in yep. a couple of cases where government changes actually lead um, to settlement of a wide range of cases. Um, thank you. One other question here, um, the second to last, and then we will close uh, the session, is um, your thoughts on the involvement of a third party funder in a dispute. Um, would that uh, tilt the scale more towards mediation or perhaps against mediation? Uh, surprise! People may be surprised. I, I found it to be incredibly pragmatic. These guys, uh, they take a kind of a long-term view. They have a portfolio of exposure. They're actually interested in getting some money returned uh, if they can. There's a way of getting the money sooner. It may not be as much. They kind of factor that in. So I, I don't see it as a hindrance to mediation in my, in my personal experience. Anna Karina, sentence. I fully, I, I fully share the uh, assessment. It, it really matches with what I experienced in the past. And um, it's, but it's nevertheless good to bring up that question of what happens if we mediate and settle early on and how much uh, of an involvement will there be on the part of the, of the funder actually. So my recommendation would be bring it up, address, address it openly uh, and expect that the answer will be um, you're free, whatever you need to do to settle this at a very comfortable rate for the for the uh, funder. And on the exit rules, um, that is what we have reflected at the first session. You need to address negotiation authority who needs to be involved to negotiate and on the and, and in a second level to conclude a settlement agreement. Who, what is the process? Who needs to sign off? And there um, that would be um, certainly disclosed. And there's a last question about what can ICSID do um, to support states if they are um, um, exposed to political internal pressures and to help states um, get to that spot um, on being able to mediate. And I, um, we certainly heard that from states. Number one, in a meeting with states in 2017, um, they explicitly said that um, they would love to mediate and what would be helpful is to have an international platform um, that is uh, trusted on the investor state dispute settlement if the mediation could work in that realm and that is what we have seen that would help um, on the domestic level then certainly our education efforts um, training for government officials our background papers our involvement in working group three and um, the work i cannot stress it enough what we um, already discussed last week in episode one 
which was the work of the Energy Charter Treaty and what is now sort of combining in the Working Group 3 that um, we look at the domestic legal framework, um, that there as mediation is anchored in the domestic legal framework that I believe will support states' ability to engage in mediation. They can do already, um, but to have that anchor will help, be it in treaties or in, in legislation, internal legislation. So with that, um, I thank you, Anna, Karin, and Joe for joining us as panelists today and sharing your experiences and your views. I thank um, the audience again um, for your patience at the beginning and for joining us um, throughout the session and uh, look forward to inviting you for our next episode, episode three, where we are going to discuss um, myths about investment mediation and how can these be addressed with James South, who is an experienced mediator and trainer at the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, and Lawrence Bu, an experienced investment arbitrator and mediator. And that session will take place on November 17. Registration remains the same via our website, and we look forward to welcoming you then again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frauke. Thank you, Anne-Karin.